So earlier this week, I had dinner with a friend. It's a friend I, I hadn't seen. He lives in Israel, lives in Tel Aviv. He's Israeli. Hadn't seen him in, I mean, it feels like 10 years since before the pandemic. And when we sat down to have dinner, we began reflecting on everything that had happened since the last time we saw each other. We look at you and go, oi! It's been some time. It's been a lot. And he says, and it stuck with me. He said, you know, in the thick Israeli accent, he goes, you know like when you watch those really intense action movies and they get you and you just can't believe it happened? I go, yeah. He goes, and then they make the sequel. And the sequel has to be more intense than the first one. I go, yeah. He goes, I feel like we're on episode five. <laughs> and what, what makes those so intense is that you don't, you plan for what you expect the world to be, and then it's not that. And if I had sat down with him years ago and said, let's, let's, let me just tell you, sh let's think about the future. We wouldn't have thought of a pandemic, of an insurrection, of wildfires, of the sun just not coming out one day in the Bay Area, of George Floyd, of shooting in synagogues, of Nazis, marching in public. None of us, we wouldn't have thought of any of it. We wouldn't have planned for it either. And it's, it's not that we don't plan, because we do plan. It's what we do. It's what we should do. It's how we exist in the world. If you think about our buildings, we retrofit our buildings preparing for an earthquake. We stick those, those exit signs there, God forbid, in case there's a fire. It's our human instinct. It's what we do. We prepare. And this week, in this week's parsha Vayishlach, we see Jacob doing this. Now, Jacob, if we go back before, Jacob steals his brother's blessing. And if you look at, I mean, if you look at all of Genesis, it's like one huge dysfunctional family. You don't want your kids to be like any of these people. And this is, there's bad moments. This is a pretty bad moment. His mother lies to her husband to deceive the other son in order to get the blessing. And then he steals the blessing from his blind and dying father, and then Esau says to Jacob, I'm going to kill you. And Jacob wants nothing to do with this, and he's scared to death, so he runs. And then he, he runs his entire life as if running to the next thing is going to make it all better, and he's going to find a new reality. But I know we have some therapists in the room. Not surprisingly enough, when he runs to the next town, he recreates the same childhood he was just in. He marries into a family where now his father-in-law deceives him and lies to him. And he marries the wrong woman. And then eventually, eventually the right woman. But he keeps running. Running away from the thing that he's so afraid of. Until finally he realizes where we are this week that he actually needs to face his brother. And he does what many of us do. He scenario plans. He thinks, hey, well, what could happen here? Because I've been really afraid of this. And so the first thing he thinks about is, you know something? Diplomacy. I'm going to use diplomacy. He sends cattle. He sends gifts, thinking that that will you know, assuage Esau's anger. But he diversifies. He realizes, you know, diplomacy might not work. And if diplomacy doesn't work, we're going to end up in a war together. And so he begins preparing for war. And so he takes his camp and he splits it into two. So just in case Esau attacks, only half of what he owns will be destroyed. So he did diplomacy with a backup of war. But then, you know, he's a nice good Jewish boy in the Torah, so he prays some too. So he prays to God. And so he really thinks he has his bases covered, that he has, he has all of this going on. But for Jacob, as for so many of us in our lives, Life does not turn out the way he had prepared. All the scenarios that he had planned for didn't actually come to fruition. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs argues that if you read this parsha, just on the shot, like on the surface level of how it's read, there is profound value and lessons on how one should respond to crises. If you add midrash to it, you get fancy, he says you kind of miss the point. Sex writes, quote, even in the 21st century, when we know so much about the universe, 
cosmology, the human genome, the working of the human brain, there is one thing that we do not know and we never will. And that's what tomorrow will bring. After Jacob does all of his preparations, the unexpected occurs. Jacob, he crosses over the Yabok River, and then in the complete darkness, he finds a man, or it may have been an angel, or it may have been himself. But none of that really matters. Because what he finds there in that darkness, he was not prepared for. And this week is a lesson on how we deal with what we didn't plan for. If Jacob had spent his life running from his external fears, he ends up planning for all the external realities that he can imagine, except for the one thing that he's been avoiding, the one thing that he was not prepared for, the one thing that he found in the darkness of that night. Now, what he saw in that darkness is what, and if you've been in the desert at nighttime, you know you can see nothing with your eyes. You can put your hand up to your face. You can't even see your hand. But what he sees that night, he sees what's within him. He sees what he's been running from his entire life. Jacob wrestled that night with the unknown. He wrestled with the fears he had of his brothers. He wrestled with himself, with his doubts, with his regrets. And he didn't have a plan for this moment. So the only thing that he could do in that moment was to react to what life had thrown at him. And then the only thing he could do was throw himself into the crises, into the unknown that surrounded him at that moment. The Rashbam, who was Rashi's grandson, who was born in 1085 in Troyes, France, he compares Jacob to Jonah. And if you remember Jonah, Jonah's the one who runs away from God when God commands him to do something. He says, just like Jacob. But in this case, it's a little different. According to the Rashbam, Jacob is running away from his fear. He runs away knowing that he cannot prepare for tomorrow. Because we never actually know what tomorrow will be. Now, according to Rashbam, God sends an angel to stop him and to wrestle him to the ground. It takes a heavenly figure to hold him back all night long in fear from the fear that he's running from. And it's not that he's living through the moment that we've been avoiding, that that moment he's running from, it's not going to leave a mark. Because in a movie, it'd be wonderful. The sun comes, he's a stronger, changed person, and he's the same. But we know that's not how life works. The crises, he, the crises that we are not prepared for, they will leave a mark. Because those experiences that we all go through they always leave a mark. These years that we've all been through with this pandemic and everything else that you can think back in your own personal lives and our national lives are going to have an effect on us deeper than any of us in this room can comprehend. And we won't be aware of it today. It may not even be in a decade from now. But the effect will be revealed over time. And Jacob, he does not walk away from that night of wrestling in the darkness. He limps away. Because limping is a part of life when you have been through the darkest of times. But if you look right before Jacob limps, you see a gift that was left for us right inside of the Torah there. Rabbi Sachs, he points out that Right before Jacob, who is now Israel, he gets his name changed from Jacob to Israel. That's his blessing. Right before he gets up to walk away, he demands from the darkness. He demands from what he did not prepare for. He demands from that heavenly figure, and he grabs the figure and says, I will not let you go until you bless me. Think about that. He realizes in that moment that being in his darkness, it can be transformed into a blessing. And then he refuses to let go 
of his most fear moment until he can squeeze a blessing out of this moment. Now, he may be limping, but Jacob has been transformed into Israel. That moment affects us. That's why we're called the people of Israel. That's how significant it is to step into that darkness. That transformation, it no longer has him running away into the darkness, but he's actually turned around, and he's now limping back toward his brother, where he falls on his brother's neck, and he kisses him. Now, Cantor Addy, earlier this week, pointed out to me, it's something I'd never known before, that this moment is so incredibly significant and transformative that we see something occur in the Torah which does not occur in any other place, in any other line, in any other word, in the entirety of the Torah. Right above that word that says kiss, there are dots right across the top of it. There's no punctuation, there's no bold or italics in the Torah. It's just a bunch of letters, except for right in this one spot. And it sticks out, it kind of pops off the page like a neon sign in the middle of all these black and white letters. And it shows us that love and peace are not found for what we prepared for, but for reacting and engaging with the parts of life that we did not ask for, the parts of life we may never have wanted. But if we grab hold of those moments, present it to us, and then demand a blessing from them, we may, we, we just may, go limping into a new day, lighter and more peaceful than we've ever been. Shabbat Shalom.